Welcome to Cincy Reformed. I'm Pastor Brandon. I'm joined with Pastor Zach. We are co-pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. And at our church, um, Zach has been doing an interesting series talking about church architecture. Uh, just kind of a, a fascinating historical sketch over just different types and why they matter. And so I thought it would be helpful to maybe bring like a piece of that here for our listeners. Perhaps you have some uh, interest in this. And so, um, Zach, maybe kick us off by just maybe telling us why it is important in the first place. Like why even even do a series on church architecture? Sure. Well, uh, practically within our church, we don't yet have a building. And so part of the importance for us is just to begin to think about these kinds of things and to think that, you know, the the design of a building matters, um, that all buildings are not created equal. And so there's a sense in which, you know, practically for us, that's why it's important. But I think that um, for our listeners and for our viewers, it's worth recognizing that we, um, this Western Christians and, um, you know, Bible-believing evangelical Christians we oftentimes don't really give uh, architecture of a church much consideration, much thought. I think that um, we struggle because we want to so emphasize the importance of teaching, and that's good, right? <laughs> that we then also can end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater and saying, well, because the Bible and teaching is of ultimate importance, well, then the church building is not important at all. We could say, oh, well, you know, the church is the people, not the building. And again, I want to say yes and amen. But to say that the church is, biblically speaking, the people and the gathering, that does not then infer that the building is unimportant. So I think we need to recognize that up from the start that um, while, while a building is not of ultimate importance, it still can matter. And why does it matter? Well, I think that one, because God made beauty. I think that's one reason that we would say that that um, architecture matters. Uh, God uh, designed creation and he gave creation not some you know, design that was uninteresting, but he made it beautiful. He made uh, the trees something beautiful to look at. He adorned the uh, garden, the Edenic sanctuary with um, gold and with uh, jewels, and it was a beautiful place. Uh, similarly, when he created the temples, he made them beautiful places. And the um, Holy Land of Canaan was also a very beautiful place, a lush place. And so God made creation beautiful. He also made us to be creatures that appreciate beauty. And it's not just the sort of appreciation that a husband uh, is obligated to say about his wife, oh, you're so beautiful, which of course that's true. But it also goes beyond that because we are creatures with bodies, with eyes, with um, uh, appreciation for the aesthetic. Uh, that's not something that is uh, accidental to our humanity. It's actually part and parcel of our humanity that we have a resonance uh, with beauty. And we have different feelings in different places. When you walk into a fast food restaurant, you have a different feeling, a different vibe come, overcomes you than if you walk into a large um, uh, big box store or if you walk into an ornate cathedral you are immediately based upon your physical surroundings because you're an embodied person you have a different association you have a different mood that's created um, there are different things that occur and could occur to you within those different surroundings and so I think that um, an author that I read um, in a book called The Architecture of Happiness, he describes that we are different people when we are in different places, and because that is how um, the architecture of our surrounding affects us. You can be a different person inside of a, 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 an old library with beautiful books, and you become a more um, contemplative version of yourself. If you go into a shopping mall, then you become someone who is much more geared toward consumption and purchasing. You're thinking about those kinds of things of how can I achieve the American dream? How can I buy and consume and purchase in such a way that that brings me joy and happiness? Or again, if you go into a beautifully done church, then that brings about a different sort of posture within yourself. And so this kind of thing, the, 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 the body matters and architecture matters because it affects our bodies and affects how we, how we think and how we 
begin to conceive of ourselves. And so those are some reasons I think that um, architecture and these kind of considerations, they uh, truly do matter. As um, James K. A. Smith says, we're not uh, just a brain on a stick. We are embodied creatures, and so those kinds of things uh, impact us. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, so if that's why it's important, maybe you could like sketch for our, for our listener, um, what are some different types of architecture? And I found uh, recently you did an episode um, uh, during one of our potlucks about, about the different types of architecture. You, you showed some slides, and we can add some to our video here today. Uh, but it was helpful to see different types of architecture because, I mean, I, I drive around the city and I see beautiful um, buildings and beautiful churches from, you know, decades ago. Mm -hmm. And it's neat to be able to kind of map on what kind of architecture style that is and maybe what even that architecture style is saying, um, even if it's implicit. So maybe you could, you could sketch for us some of the big the big um, umbrellas, I guess, of yeah. style. Sure, sure. Um, I think that... When we reflect on church history and architectural history, I think it's probably fair to say that there are three kinds of architectural style that you see in the United States. I'm not really speaking about other countries because that's not where we live. And there are going to be some different um, styles that can arise in different cultures. Obviously, style is something that arises from a culture, but that doesn't make it unimportant. And so I think that um, one architectural style that we see here in the United States, and it's very American style, is the uh, colonial meeting house. That's the kind of church building that you might think of if you think about driving through the cornfields, the wheat fields, and you see a white um, wood frame church with a steeple that's situated out there in the countryside that white country church that I think really um, is very quintessentially American. That, that's, a, that's one style that I think that uh, would be a helpful place to begin. Um, the white colonial meeting house is, uh, does a good job of, um, it does a good job of accomplishing what the name suggests. It's a great place to meet. And the meeting house was something that began in the early colonial days of the United States when the meeting house was at the center of the small town, small village, and then that, that same house, that same building, would be used for church, it would be used for government um, affairs, it would also could be used for the town school. So it would be a multi-function, multi-purpose place, and it would not necessarily have something that is distinctly Christian about it. A steeple would be there, but even the steeple is not exactly Christian. You could have a steeple on a school, for example, but uh, the steeple is probably the one thing that would give it away. And one of the things that I like to think, uh, you know, say is that if you think about a uh, this uh, this kind of a church style, if you were to re remove the steeple, would it still look like a church? If you say no to that answer, then you have a meeting house that you're talking about, a colonial meeting house, or something that is within that um, umbrella of an architectural style. And so it could be built with brick, it doesn't have to be white. But if you remove the steeple, does it look like it could be used for all sorts of other kinds of buildings? Could it be a school building? Could it be a house? Uh, could it be something that's being used for maybe a doctor's office or a nursing home? Any kind of these different visual associations, uh, if you remove the steeple, well, that tells you that you're talking almost certainly about a meeting house at that point in time. Uh, it's beneficial because it's um, conducive to meetings, obviously. And uh, especially back in the colonial times, you needed to have a place for debate, discussion. And so the meeting house style is actually really helpful when you're talking about accentuating the audible word. And so that's one of the reasons why the uh, Puritans in New England especially were very fond of this uh, architectural style. They didn't like anything that is, um, uh, is very... Um, picturesque. <laughs> they preferred what's austere and they liked whitewashed walls oftentimes. And so in terms of a very plain, um, it can sometimes be beautiful, but oftentimes very plain, very simple uh, style that accentuates the audible, then you have a, a meeting house is a style that really, I think, quite fits with that. Mm -hmm. So um, a second style then that we could uh, think about in terms of an umbrella would be the style that is um, called classical or Romanesque. As the uh, name indicates, it comes from the Greco-Roman period. And then it was then utilized in 
uh, different kinds of buildings, especially government buildings or temples within Rome and Greece, and has then been used in that sort of a way in our day. The classical or Romanesque architectural style is one where you might think of uh, big pillars, and oftentimes very ornate pillars. You might think of domes. You could think about like a, a porch, like um, with uh, big pillars on a porch. Uh, you might also think about the arches. The half circle arch is very quintessential for the classical or Romanesque design scheme. Uh, this sort of design would be seen within something like the Parthenon. It would also be seen in terms of something like uh, St. Peter's in Rome. That is the most grandiose of all of the classical and Romanesque um, church styles. And so within that sort of a church style, some of the positives about that from my vantage point are that when you walk into a place that is designed within the classical scheme, you immediately have something that is really seeking beauty and seeking to uh, capture your heart and your imagination. That this is a place where something special happens. This is a place where um, the uh, proportional design is being utilized to uh, convey order and to convey a beauty through the, way, uh, through the uh, lens of order, just like God did that within the uh, tabernacle and the temple. And um, so you, you have a place where I think uh, you can very much uh, appreciate it's a, it's a house of worship. Um, some of the downsides, however, of this classical or Romanesque um, uh, you know, design uh, scheme is that the, these buildings are oftentimes, because they were used for pagan temples, they're not really um, conducive to having a lot of natural light within them uh, because the half circle arch is not very uh, strong and so there there's a minimum number of arches that could be used and so then candles would be needed um, which kind of goes along with the temple theme this design style also uh, because there aren't as many windows within it also allowed the uh, those who utilize it to uh, have more mosaics more paintings a lot more design on the inside, and that also allowed for a lot more uh, grandiosity. Uh, much more ornate sort of things can happen within, and that fits very much with the Greco-Roman background. So more gold, um, uh, more uh, marble being used. Again, just a lot more ornate tends to fit with that uh, classical scheme. And one of the things about this that's conveying to the worshiper, and one place where I think it falls short, is that it really uh, sought to convey to the worshiper that God dwells inside the building. And that's why it's being used by um, as a pagan temple. And that's why it is a favorite scheme that's used by Roman Catholicism. That, as Rome would say, that Jesus and his body and blood are spatially inside that building. They're being kept inside the box uh, that's called the sanctuary because those wafers and that wine have been converted into the body and blood of the Lord. And so that real, that real emphasis on the building as temple really uh, fits with the design scheme that is uh, created by the, the, classical, uh, the, the classical model. But uh, Brent, any th other thoughts on that or thoughts on the, the meeting house you might want to kick in or... So in the meeting house, I mean, you were talking about talking about the, the Puritans and how mm -hmm. they didn't like so some of the ornateness. Um, so was their argument that since worship is simple, the building has to be simple to match that? Is that is that kind of where they're going with that? I think so, and I think that they really emphasize. I might say even overemphasize the reason, the human reason, the mm -hmm. brains on a stick kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, they would have very very long um, sermons. Uh, probably, uh, you know, in, infrequent Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. It was really about your thoughts being in the right place. And so they didn't want any distractions there. And they thought that the second that you begin to have any kind of imagery, any kind of uh, beauty, that that could take you away from the simple, um, the simple preaching and teaching of the word uh, rather than something that could help reinforce gotcha. the simple preaching and teaching of the word. And so the classical, then, you would say maybe is the overemphasis in the other direction, perhaps. Where, I think that's that's right. Yeah. Okay, where now the building is almost like facilitating worship because God is dwelling there. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I think so. I think that, yeah, the the 
the use of the building in an unhealthy way, mm -hmm. I think, can, can oftentimes occur within a classical Romanesque. And again, these styles are quite flexible. We're not going to expect that these are always pristine right. in our experience. You could have a classical building and that could still be a very faithful and helpful church building to, to worship mm -hmm. in. But you could also you could have a meeting house that's unhelpful as well. And so just to be clear, these uh, there's some flexibility here. But yeah, I do think there are two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And now is there a, a maybe happy middle ground or? I, I think that um, the, the Gothic, I wouldn't maybe necessarily call it a middle ground per se, because again, there's so much flexibility here. Mm -hmm. And you could have a Gothic church that goes way beyond uh, what is helpful and becomes as just as grandiose as a, a classical building. Hmm. And the, the, the Gothic can also be prone to some, um, some difficulties in it too. Or, uh, but I, I do think that I would probably prefer personally the, the Gothic style. I think it's probably the most helpful for uh, Christian worship. Uh, that design style arose within the uh, Middle Ages. And it was a style that really sought to be distinctly Christian. And how can we create a style that's really for the church um, to be um, uh, serviceable to the church and to Christ? And if you think about every aspect of a building not being indebted to a pagan background, but rather to be indebted to uh, Christian theology. And while it might not do that perfectly and achieve that perfectly, I think it's pretty, pretty darn good. <laughs> I think that um, some of the things that are distinct about a Gothic building is that uh, the, the Gothic building really um, is especially characterized, you, got, you can see this very clearly if you think about the archways. So whereas the Roman uh, classical archway is the half circle, the uh, Gothic archway comes to a point at the top. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like a melding between a triangle and a half circle, you could say. Mm -hmm. It comes to that point on top. And the thing that's um, important about that is that they discover that that sort of archway can hold a lot more weight than the half circle arch. And what that meant was that the, they could build a Gothic church with way uh, far, far more windows all around it to, to make the, the place of worship um, just um, bathed in natural light, bathed in light that comes through, perhaps through stained glass or not, but light just fills um, a, a properly constructed a Gothic church. And that sort of emphasis on natural light means there's a lot less need for uh, candles and for the kind of dark mysteries that might happen and be conducted within a, uh, a classical building. But you can you have the, the light there. And Christianity is, of course, a religion of light. Mm -hmm. uh, other things that are distinctive about um, Gothic churches that you can see in some of the maybe more... Um, uh, ornate kinds you see on the outside you see gargoyles um, oftentimes uh, that's how they're thought of but they're actually called grotesques a gargoyle is a particular kind of grotesque but those are on the outside of the building and that was intended to be a contrast with what's inside the building uh, where you have the, the the grotesques on the outside which were you know a, a picture of sin and corruption and even the demonic and that's what happens outside the church it's a warning to the world of the effects of sin and its consequences. Whereas the inside of the, the Gothic building was supposed to be the exact opposite. It was supposed to be this beautiful ordered place that would remind you something of paradise, uh, a place that was um, would reinforce that God is a God of beauty. It would reinforce as well that um, there is something uh, paradisiacal, paradise-like, about what we do in worship. Yet, one of the things about the Gothic structure with that pointed arch and all the other uh, parts of the design are all often like pushing upward is that it's always directing your eyes toward heaven. Whereas the classical design scheme can accomplish some of those things, but it, it's conveying the idea that God is inside the building. Whereas one of the great things, and I think preferable things about the Gothic it is always pointing you upward toward heaven and therefore not suggesting that God is inside the building and contained there, but rather that, as the old saying goes, we lift up our hearts to the Lord. And so I think that that's really accomplished very well and very beautifully within a, uh, within a Gothic, a traditional uh, Gothic structure. Well, we, we hope that some of that uh, might uh, be helpful for you um, as you drive around 
your own city, maybe it's Cincinnati, and you look around and see uh, some of the buildings around, around you, maybe you can start placing which uh, building is indebted to a classical design, which looks more like a meeting house, and what is indebted to the uh, Gothic scheme. Uh, perhaps you can also then think about how uh, your own church might um, capture one of those styles and what some of the positives and negatives of that might be. Perhaps you're in a church that has a meeting house and maybe it doesn't suggest much about God being beautiful and that God is a God that uh, loves beauty and he wants you to love beauty. So maybe that might be a downside of it, but probably you're in a place that is accentuating the, the audible word and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Uh, maybe you're in a classical building and you're seeing that it's very ornate and maybe that's not something that's terribly helpful. However, it does encourage you towards um, appreciating beauty and that uh, God does care about proportionality and symmetry and those kinds of things. And likewise with the Gothic, as I just mentioned. I hope these kinds of things might be helpful for you and interesting for you. If you have any uh, questions or thoughts or if you want to hear more about this kind of thing, then uh, just let us know. We'd lo love to, to consider that again in the future. But until then... This is Sincere Reform Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll see you next week.